Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another installment of Venable's post-election webinar briefs, where today we're going to focus on the elections, change in the White House, and new composition on Capitol Hill, and how that might impact various aspects of international trade. My name is Ashley Craig. I'm a partner and co-chair of our international trade and logistics group here at Venable. And along with me, I have the pleasure of briefly introducing Lindsay Meyer, a partner of mine, co-chair of the group, uh, Nick Choate, who's a senior policy advisor in our legislative shop, and Mr. Rick Haig, who is also a senior policy advisor in the legislative shop. Um, before I tip it to them for brief introductions uh, in terms of their background, just to kind of set the stage, uh, we're going to divide today's discussion into multiple parts. First, Nick and Rick will take a look at the political landscape, provide you with some analysis, conjecture, thoughts, forecasting, et cetera, as to the White House, where we are today on the 3rd of December, as well as a changing situation on Capitol Hill. Um, and we're going to tie that into various aspects of trade. And then we'll tip it to Lindsay, who will run through international trade, the various agencies that have prime responsibility for regulatory oversight, policy, et cetera. And uh, I am going to help moderate throughout, and uh, we welcome questions from those of you online. Uh, feel free to go ahead and send them our way. Our team will be gathering them, and we'll either address them as we go through the presentation here today, or uh, at the end, we do have an allotment of time where the group would love to receive and respond to your questions. So on that note, um, why don't I tip it over to the group for brief introductions before we get into the actual substance. So um, Lindsay, I'll hand it to you, and then uh, Nick and then Rick can round out the introductions. Great. Thank you, Ashley, and good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is, is doing well. This is Lindsay Meyer, and as Ashley noted, I am the co-chair of the International Trade and Logistics Practice at Venable. Uh, we are based in Washington, D.C. We have a full-service practice dealing with really all aspects of cross-border trade. Uh, we, we approach matters uh, on the outbound issues, dealing, for example, with export controls and sanctions, Likewise, we deal with issues inbound, uh, those affecting unfair trade matters, customs, tariffs, and the like. And we work closely with our colleagues in our legislative practice on trade policy issues as they may also impact business in a global environment. Look forward to speaking with everyone later today. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, over to you, Nick. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, as I should mention, I'm Nick Choate. I'm a senior policy advisor uh, here in Venable's legislative group. Uh, work on any number of issues, including trade issues, uh, before both the House and Senate, as well as the administration. And look forward to talking with you today. Thanks, Nick. And Hi, um, this is Rick. Go ahead, Rick. Great. Thanks, Ashley, and um, thanks, Nick and Lindsay. Um, this is Rick Hag. Um, I'm a senior policy advisor here at Venable. i um, been in Washington for 20 years, working on a variety of matters, um, probably the last 13 with Venable. Um, my um, practice includes work relative to transportation, uh, defense, foreign affairs, and FDA matters, just to name a few, um, and really pleased to join you all today. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. And um, I'm going to advance the slide and tip it over to Nick and to Rick for their commentary and analysis on the political landscape. Thanks, Ashley. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. I think everybody uh, is probably familiar with the outcome of the presidential race. Uh, the uh, deadline for states to certify their election results is December 8th, um, the Electoral College will meet on December 14th. Um, as of today, with all of the states now called by all the major media outlets, uh, President-elect Biden uh, has likely won the election with 306 electoral votes. Um, 
Ashley, you want to go ahead and flip to the next slide? Um, Spend a little more time here. Uh, as of today, with um, most of the Senate races that were on the ballot this November called, the Senate currently stands at a 50 to 48 Republican uh, majority. However, there will be two runoff elections in Georgia on January 5th that will ultimately decide uh, which party uh, will hold the majority in the Senate. Um, should Republicans win even one of those, they will continue to hold the majority, and uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, Senator from Kentucky, will remain the majority leader. Should Democrats win both of them, uh, it would put the Senate at 50-50, with Vice President-elect Kamala Harris being the tie-breaking vote, uh, giving Democrats the majority in the Senate. Um, <clears throat> so there is obviously a lot of attention on those Georgia runoff races, uh, which we should know the results of on or around January 5th. Um, and then it's not on the slide here, but I, I will briefly touch on the, the House of Representatives as well. Um, Democrats held the majority in the House, uh, but will have a smaller majority than they currently have. Uh, likely end up with 222 or so Democratic held seats in the House, which is 10 fewer than they have today. Um, <clears throat> which is just to say that any legislation um, both in the Senate and the House is going to face narrow majorities regardless of what ultimately happens in Georgia. Ashley? Uh, perfect. Um, so before we get into 2021 and you know what a Biden administration looks like, uh, it, there are a few things happening right now. Um, <clears throat> Congress is in its lame duck session. Uh, kind of the top of the list of items to do is funding the government past December 11th. Uh, we should see sometime next week whether that is another short-term funding bill, a continuing resolution, or if they find a way to fund the government uh, through the fiscal year, um, it, it, through the end of September. Um, <clears throat> there's increased chatter about a COVID deal coming together uh, on a, a, the next COVID relief package before the end of the year. Um, that could be combined with the funding bill that could slip into 2021. Again, that is something uh, just to continue to watch over the next uh, week to 10 days. And then the real um, variable in all of this is what, if anything, uh, President Trump will be willing to sign between now and when he leaves office on January 20th. Um, so that's, that's kind of where things stand going into next year. Rick, I'll tip it over to you to talk about some of the changes we see coming. Sure. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it very much. Um, in that same vein, um, we wanted to note on this slide um, a brief update on key congressional committees to watch in the international trade space, um, two in particular, Senate, Senate Finance Committee as well as the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, for those who are familiar um, with these members and their posts, um, it is the status quo, as we've seen the 116th Congress, minus uh, Mr. Crapo um, likely becoming the top Republican um, on Senate Finance Committee. So outside of that, um, um, it's, it's the same. The other important thing to um, note as well, obviously there are other important trade subcommittees on other um, committees of jurisdiction um, that we will continue to watch um, as the makeup of these subcommittees materializes um, more in the next um, you know, month. So we can continue to um, update those who would like to receive um, um, refreshed information. Please reach out to us on the those emails that we have on the beginning of the slide deck um, for further details as they come um, in. So thanks very much. Hey, Rick, uh, thank you. This is Ashley. I know that looking at those that are on, we've got a, a variety of folks that kind of span the spectrum of trade concerns, importers, exporters, uh, facilitators, carriers, um, logistics companies. So you mentioned that uh, we, there are other committees of, of jurisdiction that impact on trade and trade transactions, but uh, I'm just curious your thoughts, say, on um, 
transportation-related concerns. Um, so on the House side, T&I and uh, Senate Commerce, any, any speculation there, or is it still too early? Um, no, I think, um, well, obviously, um, I don't think I don't think there's going to be any dramatic changes. Mr. DeFazio is in a, in a, in a strong position. Um, one is re-election um, and uh, presumably will maintain the gavel um, for House TNI. Senate Commerce, um, you know, the only uh, variable there is who's in the majority um, and minority, depending on the, the, the Georgia votes. Um, so Mr. Wicker and Ms. Cantwell, obviously, they both work very close together on Senate Commerce Committee issues. Um, so we could see maybe a little reshuffling there, but for the most part, um, those um, components of each of the subcommittees will likely remain close to the same. Um, but again, as further details come in and any changes are made, we can certainly let folks know and be made aware. Excellent. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. So uh, back to Nick or Rick on the first 100 days comments. Sure. This is Rick. Sure. I can. Um, um, I could. I could. Oh, go ahead, Nick. Sorry. No, please go ahead. I was just going to maybe lead, um, and then Nick, you can compliment. You know, one thing we certainly are hearing from a Biden administration is certainly in the past week, um, relative to news, is. Um, the need for infrastructure, um, an infrastructure proposal. Um, I know that um, we can expect to see a fairly aggressive approach by um, the, the Biden transition team to um, work to put this together um, and with an aim to doing something in the first 100 days. Now, um, many may um, um, understand that the Build Back Better proposal that Biden has put forward um, is very aggressive. It's very sweeping to the tune of $2 trillion over four years. And that's, um, you know, half a, you know, $500 billion more than Mr. DeFazio's infrastructure um, legislation that passed the 116th Congress second session. So um, we do know, um, and we're hearing from folks on the Hill, that um, Mr. Biden is looking to you know, form legislative language around that broad proposal. Um, as of now. So those calls are taking place to the Hill and they're trying to get their arms around something that he can do um, you know, on, on, on a large scale, on a macro scale, um, going into the first quarter of 2021. Nick? Uh, thanks. Um, and a handful of other items to just be aware of uh, going into the first 100 days. Um, some of which could have legislative components on the Hill, um, although I, I think we're also likely to see a lot of just executive action on a number of these issues. Um, first and foremost on that list is immigration. Um, we we have seen a lot of executive action by the Trump administration. I, I think it's fair to say, based on his comments during the election and since, that uh, President-elect Biden will, be, uh, will move quickly to uh, roll back a number of those changes. And we do expect uh, President-elect Biden to send an immigration bill to Congress uh, in his first 100 days. Uh, it's still very much a, an open question whether that is something, uh, particularly a narrowly divided Senate, would be able to take up and uh, consider, much less pass. But uh, we do expect to see activity there. Um, climate and environment, uh, this is a place where I, I think it's probably fair to say the activity will largely be on uh, the executive action side, um, but things like reentering the Paris Agreement and rolling back any number of uh, the Trump administration's uh, regulatory or more accurately deregulatory actions in that space. Um, and then any number of other legislative priorities um, and Voting Rights Act is mentioned here. Uh, but I think the Georgia runoffs that we talked about earlier and which party controls the Senate will kind of dictate where some of the other legislative priorities in the president-elect's first 100 days come into play. And I think I'm back. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, actually, I will tip it back to you. I appreciate that. Um, I know it's not on here, and I don't want to necessarily uh, – 
get off message, but in terms of infrastructure, there's been a lot of discussion, and obviously that's important to trade facilitation, but Rick and Nick, any any just big picture thoughts as to where infrastructure might fit in a Biden administration slash new Congress? Again, just high-level comments, perhaps? Yeah, I'll weigh in first and then let Rick compliment it. Um, I, I think on infrastructure, um, obviously during the campaign, this was a focus of uh, the Biden campaign. Um, House Democrats passed their infrastructure package, as Rick mentioned, uh, this year. Um, one important like, data point here is uh, surface transportation programs, the Highway Trust Fund, uh, expire at the end of September. So there is a, a little bit of a pressure point here to potentially force action on at least one piece of infrastructure um, during the first year of a Biden administration. How how much bigger, um, how much how much bolder uh, they potentially go on that, I think, is still an open question. But there is certainly interest there from the incoming administration. Rick, do you want to add to that? Yeah, sure, Nick. Um, I agree um, fully. Um, an infrastructure um, package is presently being viewed um, as a priority um, for the first 100 days for the Biden administration. We've seen um, and heard conversations about the importance of infrastructure um, for years, um, but um, it's never um, crossed the goal line for a variety of reasons, one being how are we going to pay for this. Um, and this is going to be a, a very large um, um, effort, um, and sometimes the larger the effort and the more money it costs, it's harder to get it across um, for a win. So we'll continue to monitor the developments of this, but if they can get past some of the details of how we're going to pay for it, which is always difficult to do, um, outside of emergency um, legislation, I expect it's possible that this could be a number one priority for the Biden administration in the first 100 days. Um, so um, just wanted to add that. Thanks. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, insight analysis, and um, we're going to move now and focus on trade policy, trade regulatory oversight, and, and how the new administration and the changes in the Congress may impact that. Uh, and my colleague, my partner, Lindsay Meyer, is going to kick it off. Um, we're going to try to cover as much of the ground as we can here, and it's going to range from, of course, China all the way to the other side. Uh, we failed to mention at the beginning of our intros that in addition to our traditional trade practice, we have some subspecialties, for example, on transport logistics, maritime, um, and for example, we work very closely with Rick and with Nick on the policy and legislative issues that overlap there. So uh, on that note, I'll turn it to Lindsay for uh, thoughts and comments, and we'll, we'll go from there. Lindsay, it's all yours. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Ashley. So with that helpful backdrop of what's happening in Congress, what happened with everyone keeping a keen eye on the election results and, and the changes there, I think it's important to also turn and give consideration to the other parts of the government, which are often the lead for matters of trade. We certainly saw that under the Trump administration, where um, trade was was a top of mind topic and led many of the policy decisions. Um, and and I, so I think it's against that backdrop that it's important to understand not only what's happening in Congress, but other important appointments. Um, we're in kind of the throes of transition appointments, identification of folks who may be taking the helm within the executive branch. Um, so far, some have been identified Janet Yellen uh, obviously has been appointed for Treasury, uh, a steady hand on the tiller who had extensive experience leading the Fed. Um, some other key positions have not yet been named, for example, USTR and Commerce. So we'll be watching that with a, with a keen eye as well. Um, additionally, some of the issues also impacting trade, some of the advisors um, the NSC, NEC director has been selected. Uh, Brian Deese is taking that position. 
He is a BlackRock executive who brings a significant experience uh, with a business background. Um, in addition, the National Security Advisor has been selected, Jake Sullivan. Um, this one is what I would consider more of a reach back to um, <clears throat> the prior Obama administration, and, and I think that might be a trend. The ones that have been shortlisted or identified seem to be more seasoned Washington uh, folks who have had prior experience within the administration at some form or, or another. So for purposes of trade, it's always important to see who's at the helm of these various agencies uh, implementing the policy decisions and laws and regulations that have been um, identified as, as, as key for purposes of our trade. So as Ashley noted, we have many things to chat about, but we only have uh, until the top of the hour. So we thought we'd zero in on some of the more critical issues that we have seen over the last several years, and certainly that we anticipate being uh, critical for the next, certainly short term, and, and, and even next four years under a Biden administration. Those will include China, national security controls, trade deals, the WTO, as well as maritime trade uh, itself. So next slide, please. Oh, Lindsay, if I may, before we uh, jump uh, to the next slide, uh, just a couple comments, and then I know that uh, Mr. Haig wanted to provide some analysis in terms of Jones Act at this point. Um, but first, I think everyone would agree that trade has been front and center the last several years in this White House, and this outgoing administration has done things in, let's just say, an atypical fashion. Um, we don't anticipate, for example, Peter Navarro's role as this special trade counsel to the president to continue onward in a Biden-Harris White House. We see a reversion to a more traditional alignment, as you heard from Lindsay, where USTR will be front and center when it comes to trade deals, trade discussions with our counterparts around the world, and commerce, of course, in Treasury, state, et cetera. And there are other sub, if you will, units within the government that do touch on trade. Uh, for example, Federal Maritime Commission, Department of Transportation at the cabinet level, and of course, the Department of Homeland Security, where we have TSA and CBP, for example. Lots of names are circulating in those positions too, and we'll advise when things get a little bit more stable. But um, Rick, I wanted to hand it over to you um, for your thoughts on comments relative to uh, Jones Act, the cabotage trades, and uh, a Biden-Harris White House. Sure. Thanks, Ashley. And just quickly for me, I did want to include a few comments about the Jones Act. One in particular, um, there, um, this year was the 100th anniversary of the Jones Act, um, which was it's pretty astounding um, given how much and how often legislation can change in this town and fall to the wayside. Obviously, um, the Jones Act has proven to have staying power. Um, what we did see under a Trump administration um, um, for the Jones Act, which for those um, who may not be aware, is um, preserving uh, domestic moves between two points of the United States by water for American-built, American-owned, and American-crewed vessels. Um, and this cabotage, um, domestic cabotage law, um, is not unique um, to the United States. Many um, countries around the world um, maintain similar um, laws to preserve those types of domestic moves. Um, under the Trump administration, um, because in part the Buy American, Hire American, the Jones Act um, um, was um, favorable to the Trump administration, um, and we don't see much changing with a pivot to the Biden administration. Uh, Mr. Biden um, is on record as supporting the Jones Act, um, strong labor supporter, and um, we do not envision um, any dramatic changes with the, um, with the incoming um, Biden administration relative to the Jones Act. So I just wanted to um, add that um, bit of commentary at this point during our discussion. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you, Rick. And uh, very quickly, in terms of maritime on the international, uh, we do anticipate some changes at the Federal Maritime Commission commissioner level. Um, those of you online that deal with the FMC know that we have, for the first time in many years, a full slate of five commissioners. Uh, the current chair, Commissioner Corey, his term expires next June, and we anticipate that if he follows tradition, he will tender his resignation as chair shortly after January 20. 
uh, and serve out the remaining months uh, in his post. The next would be Commissioner Dye, and, and she's been on the commission for quite some time. Her term actually expired earlier this year, midsummer, and so she's in a holdover, which can run an entire 12-month calendar period, um, but we anticipate that she may step aside and thus enable a new White House to pick a Democratic chair or appoint one of the other Democratic members. Um, there are two, Commissioner Bensel, who's from Capitol Hill, many years on Senate Commerce, and uh, former Congressman, now Commissioner Maffei, uh, who served a bit in the previous administration, that is Obama, and came back in the current administration. And then the other Republican member is Commissioner Sola. So uh, we anticipate a little bit of change there and uh, keep your eyes on it. We anticipate the Biden White House moving at a quicker pace than uh, the outgoing Trump team did in selecting folks for these various posts. Lindsay, I'll tip it to you for China. Thanks. So just to transition, if we were to consider what the Trump administration was like, I would say that it was old tools and new rules. Um, the Trump administration looked to rules that were on the books, maybe hadn't been used in a manner that was then deployed, um, and sought to apply those old tools in a new manner as new rules. I anticipate that the Biden administration will be more of a return to predictability. Um, I think a lot of the policy issues that have bipartisan support will continue, but that there may be uh, a bit more predictability in the way the trade policy is implemented. Um, and, and that's probably most striking with regard to China. So you'll note in the slide we have really two subheadings, one the Biden administration, one a Trump administration. When we prepared initially for this uh, webinar, we we weren't certain how, what the outcome was going to be. So I won't dwell on the points of the Trump administration, kind of our predictions of what a second term would have looked like, but rather um, discuss the Biden administration and what we're anticipating there. Um, you, you can do your own compare and contrast by, by reviewing the, the bolts themselves. So from the Biden administration's point of view, what we're anticipating is that this new administration is going to continue to push China. China, as everyone knows, is our largest trading partner. It has also been the, the largest um, result of a significant trade deficit over the last several years. Um, and at the same time, there are significant national security concerns as well as a defense embargo with China. So while it's our number one trading partner, we also have a lot of restrictions and concerns with regard to, to this country. Uh, it seems as though the Biden administration will likely focus on building or, frankly, rebuilding multilateral ties with various allies in an effort to get some global support in keeping China in check. Um, we have all experienced and I think seen firsthand the significant tariffs that had been imposed, what are considered the Section 301 tariffs and the four lists of you know, thousands and thousands of products that were identified and impacted. Those have all been in place and continue and remain in place. Um, we don't see that new tariffs will be added, but the, the tariffs that are currently in place are significant and there's no immediate um, information or hint that those will be significantly rolled back. It's not, we're not expecting the Biden administration to come in and immediately uh, remove or terminate the, the vast spread of Section 301 tariffs. Now, that said, there are challenges up at the Court of International Trade with regard to the last two lists, list three and list 4A, that have been imposed challenging those tariffs and the implementation of those as not having a significant uh, or sufficient legal basis to, to apply to, to goods. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not um, the new administration attacks those and continues with the defense of those tariffs or whether or not those will um, 
see any give in terms of uh, of a slight rollback. But come January 20th, we're not expecting an immediate switchback or termination of the tariffs with regard to China. Likewise, the national security concerns that have been a focal point in dealing with China will continue. Thanks, Lindsay. And I would just add very quickly that we anticipate, perhaps even hope, that there'll be a further revisit to the ways of old in the sense that the strategic and economic dialogue that actually goes back to the George W. Bush years is resurrected, providing at the ministerial level discussions between the U.S. and China counterparts, as well as you may remember the old JCPP, which goes back even further in time. Uh, those were pretty much sidelined, absolutely scuttled the past four years, and uh, we, we anticipate that they may very well be dusted off. And I think that the trade would welcome those type of additional dialogues between the U.S. and the PRC. Um, I also would like to thank Mr. Haig for reminding me to pass along those of you online that are looking at this for CLE purposes. The code to use is TRADE2020. Again, the code is TRADE2020 for those of you looking for CLE credits on today's discussions. Uh, Lindsay, back to you for national security control discussion. Thank you. National security controls are a topic that has traditionally had bipartisan support and continues. Um, from the Obama administration, you may recall that there was an extensive review and overhaul of the export control system, recognizing that the system that had been put in place was becoming outdated and technology was being developed um, and the rules just had not kept a pace. Those same concerns of issues uh, by various countries around the world of um, undertaking significant efforts that were contrary to uh, the U.S. national security um, position were underscored under the Trump administration. Uh, so we don't see really a significant change in that policy. It continues to evolve. Um, what was interesting under the Trump administration was that the use of national security was expanded. Um, we saw this, for example, on the commercial side where the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, the regulations that support that committee, which is led by Treasury, were expanded and enhanced by purposes of FIRMA, the Foreign Investment Review Modernization Act. So the, the scope of what was considered to be national security was very broadly expanded beyond what most people had considered as traditional export controls really aligning in the defense area. Um, so I think for purposes of investments uh, in, in the Biden administration, I think the, the, the feeling is that companies um, anticipating a, a split Congress are feeling a bit more bullish. We've seen some, some rallies, obviously, in the, the Dow Jones uh, industrial. And so while there may be more business activity and more investment, certainly in the United States, from both domestic but also overseas interests, um, there will be consideration of that challenge and broad scope for national security reviews. Um, under FIRMA, as it's, as it's called, the amendments are FIRMA, it's more challenging for businesses to identify what is a national security concern. It's, it includes um, various technologies, emerging technologies, and critical infrastructure. So it's important for companies to give consideration to their, their deal. Um, so national security controls are not purely export controls. They're both felt inbound, for example, at the CFIUS um, committee review level, as well as to just undertaking global transactions. If you've got um, operations overseas within your supply chain, where either software or technology needs to flow back and forth, the review of that is certainly enhanced. Um, the Biden administration will also continue this 
review and strengthening of these export control regulations, and certainly with a focus on high-profile items. We've seen that with regard to emerging technologies and data, personal information, exposure to that overseas, as well as um, PPE, as we're all you know, in the midst of this global pandemic. Um, national security controls and the increase in enhancement of that also dovetails with the interest in ensuring greater supply certainty uh, for the U.S. and whether that's reshoring or nearshoring the supply chains, certainly for critical products, but for other products as well, um, that has been an interest. And that dovetails with, frankly, the, the Buy America, Buy American interests that Rick had noted, as which again coalesced with the Jones Act, um, but also the a resurgence in in various trade agreements that we'll talk about later, and most notably in that one would be um, the NAFTA 2.0, the USMCA, which increased origin requirements for eligible content within North America. Again, a consistent and um, coordinated effort to enhance national security controls by having supply within either U.S. or North America nearshore uh, operations. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, I know that we are getting questions um, across the board from clients and others about how will the Biden team look at sanctions, and we could spend probably the entire presentation pontificating on that, but uh, in a nutshell, it seems as if there will be little to no change on the core, like Iran and North Korea. The killing last week of the top nuclear scientists for the Iranians uh, is going to complicate the situation for the incoming Biden team. Um, we do know that the incoming president, of course, is supportive of revisiting the Iran nuclear deal. Um, the purported actions of the Israelis will, again, complicate the situation. Um, if you look at Cuba, there may be some flexibility there, maybe not going back to the Obama-era reforms right away, but we do sense that the incoming administration would be a bit more open, given what we know looking at the past. But the takeaway here is don't think that there's going to be a, a sea change when it comes to sanctions, sanctions enforcement, it should be, and we recommend it continue to be a priority for those of you that are involved in international trade. And given that you're attending this discussion, we would assume that means everyone on this call. So um, as that unfolds, you'll hear from the team here with updates and advice. So I uh, just wanted to touch on that. Uh, I'm mindful of our time and wanting to open up a couple questions. So Lindsay, I'll tip it back over to you for an uh, overview on the trade deal front. Sure. Thank you, Ashley. And a lot of these topics, one blends into the other, and, and certainly sanctions is one that it has become much more complicated. What was, you know, a simple thou shalt not deal with X um, ha has been parsed more with a surgeon's scalpel. So as a practical matter, they're much more challenging and difficult to implement. Um, the same is true with, with our trade deals. Um, I, we anticipate that the Biden administration is going to focus on the domestic economy, you know, we're in a very unique position today, given the pandemic and how our economy, like those around the, the world, have just been battered. So we anticipate that that's going to be a significant issue, um, you know, starting in January, if not sooner. Um, we I touched upon this before, strengthening labor protections, obviously, is a key democratic uh, initiative and the reshoring of supply chain um, products, certainly within critical in industries, is going to be um, important. It's It would be, I think, overly ambitious for this administration to begin negotiating new trade deals, but rather analyze those that are in place, analyze those that are uh, underway but not concluded. Um, to see what type of priorities from a global perspective want to be um, pursued. But again, I don't see that as topic number one, you know, starting in, in January. 
I do see, however, that the approach will be more to uh, multilateral agreements rather than um, the bilateral or you know do it alone approach that, that, that we've seen largely under the last uh, administration. So I think there will be more, more diplomacy and more outreach. Um, again, if this administration taps seasoned and experienced professionals um, from prior administrations you know, who have already been around the block on such issues, then I think we'll, we'll see uh, a nod and uh, really more of a return to that more traditional diplomacy. Ashley? Uh, thanks, Lindsay. I know the question um, that comes up, Lindsay, just would appreciate your thoughts. Uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Obama team supportive of it. Obviously, the current administration backed away from it completely. Uh, those remaining parties created the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement, um, the so-called CPTPP. Uh, there's talk I hear about China now trying to jump in perhaps to kind of block any sort of U.S. reconsideration. But I was curious, do you think that uh, perhaps the Biden team may prioritize doing something with what was known as TPP um, in the next 12 months or so? I think that that's one where we may see some action um, given China, given China's interest. And I think as more of a strategic move or countermeasure the Biden administration, I would imagine, would be interested in seeing what role it w would or could play um, in, you know, what was then TPP under prior negotiations and discussions, more as a strategic move to ensure that the balance of power um, doesn't weigh in one direction or another um, that would be advantageous to the U.S. interests. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, moving onward to the WTO. So the WTO has certainly been battered and bruised over the last several years, and I don't think anyone would um, say that in its current stance it's, it's, it's working effectively. Um, the Trump administration had withdrawn support for that in a pretty vocal um, and, and pointed way. So I, I don't see the Biden administration continuing along that complete withdrawal. But I do see um, consensus for purposes of reform and looking to uh, ensure that actions are undertaken that will support the body for a global trade review. It, it's supposed to be an impartial um, review to keep countries in check when there are trade disputes, um, to be objective and to be um, consistent in the application of those decisions. And so certainly reform is in order, um, and, and I would expect that the Biden administration will pu push for that reform, um, looking again for some global allies to help car carry the load as well. Thank you, Lindsay, for that. Um, so looking at the clock, we uh, are more or less on pace and have time for some Q&A. Um, one question that has come in, and um, I'll set the stage and then we can all kind of give our own thoughts if we, if we can. Um, back in October of this year, the current administration launched an investigation into under Section 301, Vietnam, in particular uh, currency uh, timber lumber. And the question from one of our attendees is whether we think that will continue onward in the Biden administration. And uh, again, this is speculation and combined with what we know. But Lindsay, any any uh, thoughts on that one, if you wanted to take that? Yeah, I, I, I'm happy to. So Vietnam um, certainly is not in the same position as China was. And China, just so everyone is, is clear, the Section 301 uh, case that was brought against China was for the, the the threat and concerns of the theft of intellectual property. Um, so the Section 301 decision and and report that was issued vis-a-vis -vis China was that there were significant concerns and findings that there were intellectual property 
theft that had occurred um, by China. And so going back to my earlier comment that the, the value of that theft was identified and enumerated, and it was then that number that was used as the basis to apply the countermeasures, which were then in the form of additional tariffs on the import of Chinese origin goods um, into the United States as, as the countermeasure to apply um, to, you know, right the ship vis-a-vis -vis the, the value of those thefts. So China has been, as I, as I noted before, it's our number one trading partner. There are certainly concerns there um, on any number of levels from the national security issues to just the, the trade imbalance. Vietnam is not as significant a player globally vis-a-vis um, -vis relations with the U.S. I would imagine that the Biden administration will examine the review, the report, um, and take that into consideration. I don't see just, you know, if you were to compare the Section 301 that we saw with China vis-a-vis -vis this Section 301 um, that has been implemented versus Vietnam, they're, they're in a different um, level of impact. I would, I, I can't imagine that the severity of any retaliatory um, effects would be as great as those that we saw with China. But I also think that there, this administration will give it consideration and will examine the facts and and determine whether or not there are um, legitimate issues for currency manipulation and the issues of timber. One of our one of our, our our favorite trading partners to the north, Canada, as we know, was was involved for many many years over um, timber related investigations and um, and countermeasures. So it, it certainly is not out of the realm of possibility, but I I don't anticipate it being anywhere near the level of what we saw with regard to China. Thanks, Lindsay. It, it seems that, uh, if you will, um, conservative advice here is uh, keep your eyes on everything that's currently in play. Uh, don't anticipate there being any swift change. Uh, there will likely be some modifications in the new administration, but let us not simply focus on January 20 as being an opportunity to just kind of wipe the entire slate clean when it comes to trade policy, as well as the various proceedings uh, et cetera. I think it's safe to say that this administration, uh, the current administration, is doing what it can to embed its policies and make it as difficult as possible for the new team to uh, rewrite that as quickly as they may want to. Um, Rick, a question for you, if you wouldn't mind, uh, and as well perhaps Nick, in terms of a potential Department of Transportation Secretary, I know there have been some names floated around, um, including Mayor Garcetti, but any thoughts there? And um, uh, moreover, again, more speculation, but how do you see uh, Biden-Harris DOT playing out in general on, on transport trade issues? Hey, Ashley, uh, great question. Um, as you mentioned, um, the LA mayor is um, one of the top two contenders, at least what we understand to be um, for the shortlist um, for Mr. Uh, Biden's um, incoming transition administration. Um, the other name that's been floated as well is Rahm Emanuel um, as another likely candidate. And then third, um, I think folks have seen um, Congressman Blumenauer um, as, a, as a possibility as well. So those are um, at least the three um, potential candidates that I've seen across my desk and others. Um, and I can have Nick um, maybe heaps has other ideas and has heard other um, rumors about that short list and who they might include. Relative to the DOT, um, you know, we are hearing there is a, um, uh, a small list of those who worked during the Obama administration at DOT who have shown interest in um, regaining um, um, some of their um, um, positioning within um, the Biden administration. Um, coming in at DOT, so um, familiar faces and names have been circulated, but those individuals um, currently sit on those transition teams, the DOT transition teams. And again, um, probably too soon to tell how those individuals may um, wind up and find themselves 
at the Department of Transportation, but again, we have a good sense of um, a small group of who they might be. So stay tuned for further details. Thanks. And thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Nick, go ahead. I think the only, the, oh, sorry, Ashley, the only thing I would um, add there is I, I think Ashley and uh, Lindsay touched on this in the trade context earlier, but um, certainly in the transportation, the various transportation sectors, um, labor unions uh, have a lot of sway. Um, transportation remains one of the places where uh, unions are very politically powerful. So I would expect to see uh, unions continue to have a uh, good amount of influence over both the pick at the top at DOT as well as the sub cabinet positions over there. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Lindsay, I think you wanted to maybe follow up on our discussions on sanctions and maybe touch on those that the attendees may want to keep in mind. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. Um, so when the Trump administration was coming into office, one of the areas where we saw the the the, the first action was by executive order. And executive orders, as everyone knows, can be drafted. And so if you have your pen and paper ready, an executive order can be issued um, by the president. We saw a lot of activity um, under the Trump administration. And that has been kind of a growing tool by presidents over the years. What's tricky and what I think people should bear in mind as we're you know, sitting here today and transitioning into 2021 is just how broad the implementation of sanctions are. So sanctions include not only the traditional sanctions that we think of that OFAC, the Office of Foreign Assets Control of Treasury issues, where you're prohibited from do, in, being involved in a transaction with a restricted party, but we also see sanctions now being implemented by the Department of Commerce's Bureau of Industry and Security, where additions to the entity list, like Huawei, will impact your business activities and, frankly, your supply chain up and down uh, the, the course. And most recently, we see now customs jumping in on, on the sanctions game with the WROs um, that have been issued, focused largely on human rights um, concerns and issues for the Uyghurs, for example. Um, just yesterday, Customs issued yet another WRO um, restricting the cotton supply from the XPDC, which is a very strong um, entity that has ties to the Chinese government and military. And there's discussion about a region-wide ban of imported products coming from there. So I think sanctions is something that people should keep top of mind. Um, I don't see a significant change, you know, as we transition from the Trump to the Biden administration. And I think they're, it's much more challenging to deal with them because they, sanctions are now popping up, you know, sanctions in the words of restrictions are popping up in places that hadn't traditionally been, been implemented. So I think, you know, as, as we look, there's, there are a lot of complexities in the trade front. Um, I don't see a quick changeover from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. And I think it's important for people to bear in mind that all of these issues continue to evolve, you know, as we, uh, as, as we move forward. Thank you. Lindsay, thank you for that. And uh, it's, um, I think, a bit comforting to, to hear that in the sense that there will be Stability. Perhaps the trade community would like to see, see some things revisited, and over the coming months, I think there will be opportunity for that. But it's always practical to at least try to anticipate as much as you can potential change. And the takeaway here is is that we don't anticipate there being very much, as you outlined perfectly. This is more apolitical than it is partisan when you really break it down. So we, we do anticipate, again, a more traditional approach. Uh, we, we look forward to seeing positions filled on a timely manner, notwithstanding the political situation that may confront the Senate. Um, for example, we anticipate there being a CBP commissioner in the near future. Um, I 
my own opinion is is that this administration coming in is going to try to draw a stark contrast and is already trying to do that with its nominations in terms of moving forward and populating key posts, unlike the outgoing Trump administration that was perfectly content with acting positions um, or even folks that had assumed the administrative functions of certain individuals like we currently have within CBP. So that should also be a bit of comfort for the trade community, knowing that the government will be functioning and there will be people there that we can turn to for guidance, et cetera. Um, so uh, we do have a few moments left, uh, and I don't know if we have any additional questions from the audience, but uh, I'll open it up and see if there are any questions. Feel free to drop them our way. And if not, then um, we can go ahead and round out today's discussion. So not seeing anything coming in, um, let me thank Lindsay and Nick and Rick for your time, your expertise, commentary, uh, and overall for today's discussion. I hope that those in attendance found it to be practical and insightful. Um, as you heard from all of our colleagues on this line, we will continue to monitor all of these issues closely from the legislative front to the executive team um, and accompanying policies, proposals, et cetera. And as we typically do, we'll try to keep you, our clients, and our friends up to date with our insight and analysis. So on that, again, let me thank my colleagues for their time, participation. Uh, many thanks to our marketing team for putting this together. And on that, um, thank you all for participating in today's discussion.